We've heard from other people a little bit here and there about working on the ranch. Mm -hmm. um, is it true that the work hours were insane and that these deadlines that Warren was making were really unattainable? What was the work life like when you're there? Yes, uh, crazy hours. Uh, no exaggeration, no, no lie. We were working 22 hours a day, seven days a week. Welcome back everyone, my name is Sam. And I'm Melissa. I grew up in the FLDS community. It is a polygamous group run by Warren Jeffs and I moved out when I was 18 years old. I was raised LDS. Sam and I have been married for nine years and have two awesome kiddos. Yes, we do. And if anyone here would like to just listen in today, we do have our podcast available and please don't forget to like and subscribe. We are so excited today to have a special guest with us, Isaac Steed. Isaac, welcome. Thank you so much, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for being with us. We're very excited to learn more about you and your story. And we actually want to just say right off the bat that we've heard from multiple people now that you have a very interesting book available that people can read a little bit more in detail about your story as well. I'm grateful to say, yes, finally got done. Took years, but it's out now, yes. That's awesome. awesome. And for our viewers, we are going to leave a uh, link in the description so that you can hop on Amazon and be able to buy Isaac Steed's book. It's called Devotion, Deception, and Deliverance. And it's all about Isaac's story, which we'll let him give us a little bit of a teaser today. And then we'll send you over there to be able to get the book and get all of the nitty gritty little details from there. Yes. So let's just start a little bit. I imagine your book starts from the beginning of your life uh, story and your childhood and that. So could you give us just a quick rundown on where you were born? What was your family dynamic like when you were a child? Yeah, you bet. Uh, basically, born and raised in the FLDS church. I was born in Hildell, Utah, but uh, my parents lived in Sandy, Utah. And I had a wonderful childhood. I had three moms when, when I was born. Uh, that's all I knew growing up. Uh, obviously, I learned that the world was much different and bigger than, than my little world as I grew up. But again, I wouldn't trade my childhood for anything, honestly. I wouldn't trade it with anybody. Sure. It was a wonderful childhood, wow. great parents who were, who were morally clean. Uh, if people can understand that, and if they can't, I'm sorry. Uh, they, they need to learn more. But very good parents, <laughs> <laughs> very good family. We had a great time playing basketball with our, you know, I had, my mom had 16 kids herself. Uh, one of the other wow. moms had 12 kids and another mom had 10. So we had a big family and it sounds familiar. <laughs> that's right. There was never a dull moment. Just lots of, lots of good times. Obviously there were hard times. You know, humanity is humanity. We had our growing experiences and our struggles, but I wouldn't trade my childhood for anything. Uh, as I got older, I got married through through assignment, you call it. You know, the, the prophet, Rulin Jeffs, uh, one day met with me, and a few hours later he called me and said he'd like to place his granddaughter by my side. So I ended up marrying Rulin Jeffs' granddaughter. Wow. Oh, wow. That okay. must have been a big honor. It was. It was. Uh, it was a sweet experience. It was precious to me, very sacred. Were you living in Sandy at that time, or were you living in the Short Creek area? Sandy, Utah. Yep. Okay. Living in Sandy. We got married in 1998. We had our first child in 99. I was 21. She was 19. Then things kind of fast forwarded into the chaos that everybody is so familiar with when Warren Jeffs took over. And in, in 2004, uh, he placed my second wife by my side in January of 2004. We don't really get to talk to a whole lot of people, or we haven't had a whole lot of people on that have talked about marrying a second wife or a third wife. And so what could you tell us how that worked just so that our viewers can understand uh, when it comes to getting married again, you, you're married to your first wife, you married, you said the, the granddaughter of Ruth and Jeffs, which would have been a crazy experience all in a, on its own because you're marrying in a way into the Jeffs family, which we all know how big of a deal that would have been. And then 
so you're married to his granddaughter and you are called, I assume, by Ruth and Jeffs again for the second wife? Or how, how did that work for the for the second wife? The second wife happened after Ruth and Jeffs had passed away, and that was through Warren Jeffs. And again, there was okay. mystery and secrets and chaos, and uh, it was more complicated. Uh, there's hmm. The book could have been 10,000 pages, but it's kind of summarized hmm. in the book uh, about what went on. Uh, but very secretive. I had never met my second wife in person. Didn't know she existed until I walked into the room and there was her and her father and Warren Jeffs. And we were married that instant. The marriage was never consummated because immediately after I was called to Texas to help uh, redeem Zion uh, is how, how it was put. So wow. I went to the YSD ranch in Texas Okay, I have a couple questions about the Texas Ranch because that's something that I never experienced as a young boy. All I experienced about it was the fact that I'd be living my humble little life in Short Creek area and all of a sudden someone would just disappear. And it was so secretive uh, from my perspective at least. No one talked about it. No one knew where they were going. No one knew when or if they would ever come back. All that I knew or all that I was told is that they were more worthy. They were more worthy than us. Therefore, they were able to go and help build up Zion, as they called it, and as you just referred to it as. So what was, I have a thousand questions about it, but two of the main questions, what was it like when you got the call that you did have to go or that you were assigned to go to Zion, if it was a good thing in your mind or a bad thing? And the second one lead up question to that would be, did you tell your family, take your family with you, or did you have to leave them all behind at that point? Oh, so many things I could say too, and we could talk about this forever. But yes, it was a great privilege. Uh, I considered it a great privilege to be called to go. I didn't have a clue, just like you said. All I knew is people had ended up gone, and there was you know gossip going around that they were gone, disappeared to help redeem Zion. And like you said, I didn't know if I was ever going to see them, my dad being one of them. And mm. so he had already left uh, a few months prior and he showed up one day at, at my door, which I hadn't seen him for several months. So it was a, a great privilege to see him. And he indicated to me that the prophet Warren Jeffs wanted me to write a letter to him and, and bear my testimony and so forth. And I was a very faithful, believing, wholehearted individual in, in the principles of the FLDS church, which are the, the Mormon church's principles also, with the exception of polygamy. Right. Uh, being raised in polygamy, obviously that was my tradition, my understanding. So getting the second wife was just what I knew was going to happen all my life if I was a faithful man. Uh, it is something I would just, you know, input into here right now, a little, a little blurb, not something I recommend for anybody that hasn't been raised and, and taught the, the purity and the motives and the righteousness. And it's not for, it's not for most people. Uh, but I will say my dad lived it and he lived it right and I lived it and I lived it right, but it's not something for me anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just one of those things that, well, we could talk about that for a lot too, but basically well, we'll get back to the topic. Yes, it was a great privilege for me to get called uh, to help redeem Zion. And I wrote the letter, like I said, and a few days later, I got a call from from Warren Jeffs personally, which was a great surprise. Hadn't heard from him for years. And mm. he told me to to meet him at a certain location. You know, everything was mysterious and secretive. So I met right. him yeah. at this, this location, which was his father's old house. And a van pulled up and I hopped in the van and they hauled me to a different location. And then anyway, it was just. Oh my word! Very, very strange. Was this at the time that was Warren just on the run from the FBI at this point? Is that why there was so much extra security? 
That's exactly right. I was just going to say that. He was on the top 10 most wanted. I remember those days where all of a sudden, you know, these mysterious vehicles would be pulling up to places and people would be in and out and then jetting off to different locations. And you kind of see things like that happening throughout the community. And I didn't even dare ask. You know, I didn't want to be smitten by God for even asking such a thing that I wasn't allowed to know or something. You know, it was that it was that secretive. It was a very big deal during those days. That's correct. Yeah. Well, we all I say we all because there were 12 of us that ended up uh, showing up at his this room in in the far wing of his house. And he gave us a, a long talk about the mission of redeeming Zion and revelations on what the Lord, the Lord was trying to do. And he told us that we would be picked up and hauled somewhere to help redeem Zion. We didn't even know the location yet. So I went home and I told my family that I had been called on a mission. I called into my work, told them that I was called on a mission. And a few days later, a vehicle showed up. Uh, Jim Jessup, Merrill Jessup's son, showed up in a vehicle and I hopped in and he hauled us. We drove for 20 hours. I didn't know where we were going, but we headed south and ended up in Texas. <laughs> we wow. started just building log cabins and homes. Wow. How, now, how crazy. Uh, we've heard from other people a little bits here and there about working on the ranch. Um, is it true that the work hours were insane and that these deadlines that Warren was making were really unattainable? What was the work life like when you're there? Because obviously everybody from the FLDS are such hard workers. You all are so amazing. You have amazing construction businesses. You guys are just all so good at that type of thing. And are such hard workers and it sounds like he just was trying to like run people into the ground but and that's what we've heard but what was it like for you on the job sites at the ranch yes uh crazy hours uh, no exaggeration no no lie we were working 22 hours a day seven days a week <sighs> wow. for eight months i think that lasted oh my word what about the Sabbath day? We worked on Sundays also. Oh, wow. wow. That kind of goes against the teachings of the church, though. That's interesting that he would require that of his followers. Well, maybe not if it's building up Zion, though, right? Building up the kingdom is... Yeah. There was always an explanation to any contradiction. <laughs> of course. That was, <laughs> that was his go-to, right? There was always a, a reason that he would pull out of somewhere... So you said that you told your family, you told your work, and then you were gone. Did your family just stay behind and, um, well, good luck, husband. I hope I see you again someday, or what was that like? Basically, yes. They knew that I had been called by the prophet, so they trusted that I was a good man, and that was an encouragement to them that I was trusted by the prophet. Uh, so they just mm. put their trust in God and went on living life without me. And I was gone for almost a year. Uh, didn't see them very often, uh, probably three or four times throughout that year. During that time, did they were they invited to the ranch to meet with you th those four times a year? Or did, you, or did you come back to Colorado City area? I came back to the Colorado City area to see them. Man, I can't imagine. How many children did you have at that time? I had three children. So three children and two two wives, and they weren't allowed to be there. Only the worthy ones were allowed to be in Zion. So uh, I they never showed up while I was there. In November of 2004, Warren Jeffs found enough reasons in his mind to, to kick me out. I had started asking questions, and I'd started, you know, having some serious concerns about some contradictions and I was one to ask questions in a, in a humble way but I started asking questions and he didn't like that at all so he started making me an enemy and decided that he was going to kick me out in at the end of November in 2004 told me to travel to Hilldale uh, gave me a hundred bucks I didn't have a vehicle I didn't have a phone I didn't have any money 
gave me a hundred bucks for fuel and sent me on my way. I showed up in Hilldale and my house was vacant. My family was gone and I had to start over in life. Oh my word. As a husband coming back, was it, did you ever have a thought of, oh, I'm going to go and try to find my wives or was it pretty clear at that point from other examples made in the community that that wasn't an option, that you weren't going to have any type of, I don't want to say a right to your wives, but like you weren't going to be able to have a marriage outside of the church and that you just had to accept that. I was very faithful and devoted. So I knew I had no right to my wives at that time. And I knew that I had to repent and somehow earn them back, earn my family back. And so I spent the next several years not knowing what I needed to repent of because I hadn't committed any sins but still trying to get in the good graces of, of God and the prophet again, which was torture. And like, like everyone knows now, Warren Jeffs was a very immoral individual, very deceptive. And there was no way I was going to repent and get my family back. He just wanted to exercise his power and authority. And I was a threat to that power and authority because he knew I was asking questions and I wasn't going to put up with or stand by and support the things he was doing. Wow. Wow. So you return to Hilldale or Colorado city, Hilldale area. You go to your house, your family's gone, but you're still allowed to use your house. No, they, they sent me to Mesquite, Nevada to find a job and to repent. Okay, oh, so they kicked you out away from your house, away from your family, to Mesquite. At that point, did you have any idea where your wives and children were? Uh, no, I didn't, but I later found out that they had moved in with their fathers. They had been sent back with their fathers. And again, I'm a, I'm a spiritual man, so I'm going to talk spiritually. But I had a dream about a hundred days later, exactly a hundred days later, that that they were in in Zion. They had been moved, my, my first wife and the children had been moved to Zion. And so I made a phone call and found out that that was accurate. So they got moved to Zion wow. after I got kicked out and they married another wow. man. And then a few months later, that man was sent away and they married another man. Anyway, just, chaos and misery and torture on people. Can, can I ask a, a rather personal question? Of course. What, thank you. When you, I, I just cannot even imagine. I left the community when I was 18 years old. I was never married. I had no children in the FLDS community. But I hear these stories of these men and women that were just ripped apart, torn apart, children sent this way, wife sent this way. And then, like you mentioned, remarried. The wives would remarry, and then that man would get sent out. They'd remarry. Was I know that you were very spiritual and you were very faithful to Warren Jeffs at that time in the church, and you were just trying hard to get back. But how how could you survive that, knowing that your wives or your wives and your children are being sent with other men and being forced in ways to marry and be with these other men and possibly? having children with these other men. How, how could you survive something like that? It's not something that's survivable. And, and I prayed every night for years that I wouldn't survive it, that God would take me in death. And that might sound like the, the coward's way out, but I was very faithful and I believed I had a flaw in my character that required me to go through this. And, mm -hmm. So just the confusion, the struggles, the, you can't describe it. It's not something that, that can be survived. Again, I attribute the survival and the fact that I still have a brain that's not turned into a mental wreck uh, to God and his help and, and helping me through it and other good people that I met and became friends with and supported me. Wow. How about how long after you'd been sent away? And we hear this with, you know, other people too, that you're in the repentance process and you're just trying everything you can to get back into good graces. 
how long did it take before you realized maybe this isn't what I thought it was and maybe I don't want to get back in favor with Warren Jess anymore because this isn't what I thought. Sad to say, uh, because humans love to find every reason to, to, to find all the evidence that corroborates what they believe. <laughs> they don't want to find evidence that proves them wrong. And that's how all of us are, sadly. But it took three or four yeah. years before the evidence was there that I thought, you know what, maybe, maybe I do need to look into this more because I wasn't even looking into another thought process or another possibility. But after three or four years of utter misery and, and me trying to repent and not, not having any encouragement and any honesty or any human decency from the FLDS leaders or members, I said, maybe it's time for me to look into this. And that's when I, I pulled up the video of Warren Jeffs in prison uh, confessing that he had done immoral things with sisters and daughters and so forth. And, and that was the beginning of another torturous journey, trying to put the pieces back together in my mind and get through the anger and the, the trauma that all that causes. Did you ever see your children or wives again after they were taken from you? Not for four and a half years, I believe it was. And that's when the state of Texas raided the YFC ranch and posted the thing online that said, if the biological parents don't come claim their children within 14 days, they'll become wards of the state. And I read the list mm -hmm. of all the children and my kids were on there. And I, again, wow. knew, figured they were there anyway. Uh, when I saw their names, I told my employer and headed down to Texas. Uh, I didn't see them at that moment, but they, they wouldn't believe my social security cards, my pictures, birth certificates, the authorities, which makes me very angry still to this day, wouldn't trust me on all that. So they demanded DNA tests, which I willingly gave them. They said they'd have results in seven days. They wouldn't answer my phone calls or respond or let me communicate for 42 days later. Uh, they just evil, evil people. And oh my after Lord. the 42 days, I got a call from one of their child advocates. That's their title anyway. And they informed me that the courts had ruled or were, were going to rule that the kids were to go back to the mothers. And the only reason they hadn't contacted me was because they figured I was still part of the FLDS church and they didn't want to give the kids back to any member of the FLDS mm. church. They knew I was their father, but anyway, just, it, it was a terrible ordeal. So do you think but, that if you had shown up, do you think if you had shown up in Texas that day in short sleeves and in shorts, that maybe they would have been more apt to give your children back? I did show up. I did show up in short sleeves. I had already started to wake up and realize the, the mess a little bit. So I was in short sleeves and, and I was not part of the FLDS church, but they would not believe me. Okay. I was just going to say, I'm like, the government's not going to believe that when you look at the way that Warren Jeffs was dressed and the way he was behaving when he was out on the run from the law, right. they're not going to trust that they know that people are going to disguise or, you know, this mistrust of the FLDS people and the government not recognizing the difference between Warren Jeffs and the people who are all, like the victims of Warren Jeffs or they're having to deal with that. And these are good people. They're not making that distinction between everyone right. in their mind. So they're like, well, if Warren Jeffs goes around in short sleeves and shorts at strip clubs, then why would I believe this guy who's coming, right? And instead of taking it case by case, which is what the law is meant to be doing. Right. So infuriating. Right. That's exactly right. And one thing that didn't help matters in my case was that the authorities had had found all the documentation and records and in the revelations of Warren Jeffs, a month before he had sent me away, he had received a revelation that I was to be ordained an apostle and I was going to become the next prophet of the FLDS church. 
so those those writings only convinced the authorities more that I was just just trying to deceive them. Oh my, oh my gosh. Word. That okay, this brings up another topic of questions. <laughs> so, first of all, I am so sorry. And, and I imagine, like you said, if if the authorities see that oh, this was this man is to be the next prophet or apostle, I can see that causing a whole extra load of difficulties trying to get your children back and even seeing them. So, I'm sorry that Oh man. And then a month later after Warren says these things kicks you out. That just is so infuriating. But I do, I was going to ask really quick because this is information I've actually never heard within the FLDS church, even though I was raised in it. You mentioned becoming an apostle or that Warren was talking about that. Did the FLDS church actually have apostles or 12 apostles as the mainstream LDS church does? Uh, never organized completely in, in how it should be according to the, the Mormon doctrine. But that was one of the, we came to find out, that was one of the, the purposes of going to redeem Zion was to call the men that were proven worthy to reorganize the church and have the, the apostles and the, the high priests and all the quorums as it should have been. Oh, well, okay. and that makes sense too, because I mean, you were building a temple because that's a question people always ask, or especially where I grew up mainstream LDS, you know, we were like, it's interesting. They have all these fundamentals, but they don't have apostles and they don't have temples, which is a temple is very, very fundamental to Mormon doctrine. And so we always thought from the outside looking and we're like, oh, that's really interesting that they're fundamentals and all, fundamentalists in a lot of ways, but they don't have temples. And so then when we heard Warren Jess was building a temple, that made sense. So it makes in my mind, it makes sense that they would, that he would try to yeah. add that at the same time. Try, try to bring everything back together. That, that does make sense. Okay. Well, thank you for answering that. I wasn't sure. I had been raised in the FLDS church and never heard about an apostle. And I always wondered because I know that it's a very big thing in the LDS church. So uh, thanks for clarifying that. Your children were sent back to their mothers and did was that the end of it? You just, uh, well, I have no chance at this point? Or, or how did you go forward there? Well, the hard thing, uh, the tragic thing, but also something I was very grateful for, the, the Child Protective Services, who I have a, a severe hatred for, I'll just be honest, uh, invited me to visit with my children right before they were sent back to their mother. So I hadn't seen them for four and a half years, and I got to spend an hour and a half with them right before they took them away and sent them back to their mother. And it was a sweet experience, but also very traumatic for everybody. Anyway, I could go into a lot of detail, but they got sent back to their mother and their mother was moved. I found out later to San Antonio, to San Angelo, to, you know, scattered all across Texas, moved from here to there, a month here, three months there, eight months there, just chaos and destruction and turmoil for, for women and children. The modus operandi of Warren Jeffs, just he's he's a destroyer, mm -hmm. and that's what happened with them. Mm -hmm. And finally, after wow. oh, it was probably eight nine years, I finally decided to move on with my life. I had had met a girl, and I finally filed for divorce uh, from from my previous, from my first wife, I, I had been hesitant filing for divorce because I wanted to have all the legal protections I could to get my kids if it came down to it. But finally I filed for divorce and at the same time filed for custody of my kids, which took a long time and a lot of money, a lot of effort, but I finally got custody of my kids. I got the divorce and when I went to get my kids, oh man, just, more and more heartache and, and hell. But Lyle, the bishop of Shore Creek at the time, told them to cause as many problems for me as they could. And so they did. They would steal things and vandalize things and lie and just cause all sorts of problems to where the woman that I had, wow. had met, her name is Stacy. Uh, we were living together at the time. Uh, we were we were married 
I came home from work one day and she said, I can't do this. So I just okay. gathered my kids up and said, I could put you in a military school. I could, I could force you to wake up to reality and to understand the truth that you're so unwilling to hear. Uh, but I don't want to do it that way because I know it would, it would damage you even more and it would be even harder on you. So I'm just going to tell you that there is a lot that you don't know and you refuse to know, but the truth will come out eventually. And when it does, I am here for you and give me a call and I will always be here for you. Mm. They went back to their mother mm. and eventually they, well, my two boys, they now have contact with me. They called me up one day and apologized and said, thank you. And we understand now what you said and what everything that's gone on and we're sorry. Wow. So I have contact with my two boys, but my oldest daughter is still part of the FLDS church. And as mm. headstrong and determined to do what's right in her mind, which is hate me and I'm not her father, and she's following Warren Jeffs, so. It's so hard in the situation with children when, I mean, you, you and Sam can understand firsthand how hard it is to come out of that mentally, you know, and yeah. especially as children where you're just trying to follow, especially, I feel like children, particularly with their mothers, you know, there's that bond of like, I want to please my mother. I don't want to disappoint my mother. And so I, it's, I just can't even imagine. We we tell people on our channel quite often that a lot of times when when mothers have left, or in your case, a father has left, and they're trying to get custody of their children, and you feel like the the war is won once they get custody and they're out of that circumstance, and now it's all <clears throat> rainbows and butterflies, and we're like, that's just the beginning of a process of a very long healing process because those kids don't recognize what you just did for them. They don't recognize it. They're not grateful for it. So I can't wait to read your book and hear even more about this. Yes, um, before yes. we wrap up and let you go, though, I just want to ask, how is life now? I mean, now this has been so far since then and bringing this all up for a book. What was that process like for you to to have to relive it? Was that healing? Was it painful? Was it both? Both. Yeah, I was just going to say both. Uh, it's good to talk to people who are uh, mature and open-minded. It's good to talk to people that aren't judgmental and shallow and get it out, which the writer was very motherly and understanding and patient. So it was good to talk in that sense. But yes, reliving it all and even right now talking about it. Uh, getting emotional and it's difficult uh, but my life right now to answer the rest of your question oh life is full and challenging and stacy uh, i married her back in 2014 and a month ago we got divorced because one reason being this book oh, brought up a bunch about my happy life before and my previous relationship and the the love and happiness that I had with my first wife. And I had talked to her about that a lot, but once it was on paper, it became a little more of a sting to her and began a rub and a bunch of other things. I definitely am not perfect. I've made many, many mistakes, but she decided she didn't love me anymore. And she got mixed up in a bunch of other nonsense and she wanted a divorce. So. So sorry to hear that. It is. It's tragic, but you can only do what you can do. Like I said, life kind of throws some curve, curve balls at us, and we got to deal with them the best we can. So I'm just trying to improve day by day and move on, making my life as good as I can make it. Yeah, yeah. that's all you can do, especially after everything you've been through. I mean, people come to me and say, wow, you have such an interesting story. And in my mind, I think, no, Isaac. <laughs> has an interesting story. People like you that were uh, so much more involved through marriage and having children and, and working side by side with Warren Jeffs at the ranch that I was never worthy enough to attend and things like that, which I look back now and boy, am I grateful that I was never quote unquote worthy enough to be a part of these things, but you're very lucky. Yeah. Yeah. 
thank you. I agree. And, uh, but during the time it hurt to not be worthy enough, or at least I thought that it was uh, all about me, but. Well, but I know that this book in particular, like I said, we will leave a link down below for all of you watching. Please go check it out, buy it, support it because people who are willing to be so brave, like thank you so much, Isaac, for meeting with us. I can't wait to read it, but the bravery and the courage it takes, but I don't even know if you all realize how much impact and how powerful your story is and the way that you can help lead people to compassion. And we try to do that on this channel, let people realize that there's more similarities than differences between just humankind, you know, and people will be able to relate to certain aspects or certain traumas. And I know that can make a positive impact on those. The last question that we always like to ask any of our guests is if you could say something to someone who is still in the FLDS, or in this case, maybe your daughter, and you yeah. felt like they were going to completely listen to you and be completely open to it. What would you want to tell them? Wow. So many things. Uh, number one is like I've already told them. The truth is the number one thing we need to focus on. Truth and goodness. And even if it goes against what we understand or want to believe, truth is what we need to hold fast to and live by. Uh, it's, that's a growing experience for all of us. For me, still, I'm still learning truth and still changing. Uh, we all need to have that mindset. I guess that's what I would say is, if she was listening right now, I would express my love, uh, which will never die, and my desire for the best for her to hold to the truth no matter what it is hold to the truth thank you well, I love that I love that and it's so so important that people look at things that way and just like you said with your sons you can't force them to believe a certain thing and what you the way you handled it for them and the way you're currently handling it with your daughter even though it's it's just so sad to think that you don't have a relationship with them, with her at all at this point, but letting them come to the realization on their own is really the only way to do it. And like you said, hold on to that truth because you know, I know, we know that eventually the truth will be different in their minds as they learn more and more about what Warren Jeffs has done. That's right. It can't be hidden forever. Yeah. Well, thank you so very much, Isaac. We're so grateful for you coming on and we're just grateful for all of our viewers who are also on here supporting us, supporting this cause, supporting people that are brave like Isaac for sharing their stories. We just are so grateful for all of your support. And if you would like to continue to support us and support this cause, then please like and subscribe. And, and check out Isaac's book. We'll leave a link below. Yes. It's, uh, I'm really looking forward myself to read it. And this will have a lot more details on the things we just lightly touched on today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Isaac. Thank you all for being here and watching today. We look forward to talking with you soon. Talk to y'all soon.